Hi, everyone. My name is Allie Weiss, and I am so excited to welcome you to Virtual Camp Love Honey 2020. Coming off the wild success of last year, we have a packed day of talks, panels, interactive workshops with experts all over the world who are helping you to live your happiest life in and out of the bedroom. I am here with our lovely keynote speaker. Would you love to go ahead and introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about what you do and then we'll get started. Hi, Allie. Thank you for having me. Shout out to Camp Love, honey. I'm so disappointed that we're not actually somewhere super cool in the middle of the woods talking about getting freaky and feeling all the love with each other. Yeah. But I think virtual love is a good substitution. If I had a choice between no love and virtual love, I'm going to pick virtual love. Uh, my name is Shan Boudram. I talk about sex, love, and relationships for a living. I am a sexologist, an author, and the host of Sexology, available on Quibi five days a week and also an ambassador for Love Honey, which I think is an incredible resource for people to get affordable, accessible, and plentiful when it comes to all of their sexual happiness needs. So I'm really happy to be here. Shout out to you. And I think that we look like sisters. That's all I got to say. <laughs> I am tremendously flattered. Please tell me again. That's one of the best I feel like I see a lot of face. Like I'm looking at us side by side and I'm like, cause you know what? Sometimes I get the, um, you know, when people say who you look like and I'm sure yes. do you get Amy Winehouse ever. All the time. <laughs> okay. Cause I also time. get that sometimes too. So I'm looking at you. I'm like, I don't see Amy Winehouse, but I do see Allie Weiss. So there we go. I'm just going to start saying that I look like Shan Boudram. Um, but yeah. also, when I have the, the winged liner, had, had I known that you were doing like a half up, half down, I would have done that instead of putting it back and trying to look professional. Because if I had the liner and the hair, it would have been like, we could have just been impersonators, you know? Girl, like, this is love, stuff. honey. Look professional for what? No. <laughs> but this look is your profession. This is your profession. So you can get away with that. you like... <laughs> Who's this random presenter <laughs> dressed like, you know, a dominatrix in, in her bedroom, you know, with nobody watching. Um, but that, this all seems like a good place to start. Uh, the overarching theme of both Love Honey as a brand and Virtual Camp Love Honey is sexual happiness. So I would love to kick us off by knowing what sexual happiness means to you. I think sexual happiness is when your sexual desires get to be in full bloom and those desires are not impinging on your health or happiness or the health or happiness of others. It's getting to a space where you get to celebrate all parts of your sexual being, be that your orientation, your identity, your expression, your kinks, your self pleasure play. Um, it's a space where you feel like this is an area of your life that enhances every area of your life. I've been in the space for about 15 years now, and I began because I couldn't understand why people overlooked their sexual life as a means of having a happy life. And so sexual happiness to me is happiness, period. I don't even think you need the sex in there. It's almost inherent that if you feel good about your body, if you feel good about your connections, we're all sexual beings. And if you feel jurisdiction and empowerment over this area of your life, it will trickle over into all other areas as well, too. Yeah, I completely agree 100%. And for me, such a huge component of sexual happiness is freedom. Um, freedom yes. inside the confines and walls of my own body, freedom to be myself with a partner, freedom to ask for what I want. I think that there's like a tremendous amount of liberation that plays into sexual happiness. Where has that? freedom taken Where has freedom taken me? <laughs> Uh, everywhere, everywhere, <laughs> into a lot of situations. Some of them I'm very proud of, some of them maybe not so much. But um, I, I definitely think that it's a holistic thing. You know, I've, I've discovered a direct correlation between how much I'm feeling myself as like a woman in the world and how much I'm feeling myself as someone else's sexual partner or my own sexual partner. I love that point, though, too, because freedom doesn't necessarily mean freedom to do things perfectly or freedom to uh, experience copious amounts of joy. It also means freedom to mess up. It means freedom yeah. to try something that you don't like, freedom to step outside of the comfort zones and feel like, oh, I feel more comfortable inside of them. So I think it's a really important note of what sexual liberation and sexual freedom is. It's not a goal for perfection. I certainly have not met that goal if that is the goal, but it's the goal to be able to explore unashamed and to discover your likes and dislikes through that exploration in a healthy and happy way. Yeah, for sure. And I, I noticed that 
when I started being honest, both with myself and with other people about the fact that I was not a perfect woman, it changed my life for the better in all ways. Um, and I'm very lucky in the sense that part of my kind of career persona is someone who's like unabashedly imperfect. But, you know, in the beginning, I think it was a creative choice. But then I noticed I kept practicing it more and more and more. And the more I would tell my friends and my family and myself, that like, you know, at times I was a complete mess, the sexier I got in the eyes of both others and myself. So I do not think that we can like overstate how important that is to, to learn to be okay with kind of letting it all hang out. I agree. And I think it's also learning to be okay with your freedom, meaning that you don't do much or try much, right? I think that like <laughs> when you get into being sex positive and sexually healthy and you embrace the sexual happiness mantra as a part of your everyday life. There's also a pressure to be like the most liberated, the most experienced, the most like, you know, whenever you play that game, never have yeah. I ever, you're supposed to be the person yeah. who always loses because you've done it all. Yeah. Um, and that was the thing I struggled with. I went to school for sexology, maybe about five years ago or so. And we were learning so much. One of the things that we did was this course that's called the sexual attitude reassessment or SAR course. And you're exposed to all of these kinks. You're exposed to all these various ways that people interact with others and themselves to find pleasure. And I would go home every night, like, I got to try that. I got to be on top of that. I got to do this. I got to be the most liberated. And then I realized I'm like, no, I don't. Like, it's okay to say that's not for me right now and okay to find what is your yum right now. Um, but I think that the goal is to get to a place that no matter if you engage with something or not, you just embrace the fact that there's so many ways to discover sexual happiness. And finding the one that's best for you never means judging what's best for somebody else. Yes, absolutely. And I think we're also living at a time that's very extreme and people like to live by black and white and they think that there's one way of doing things and one way that's not correct. And it is important to do, as you said, uh, you know, to just take a step back and think, okay, I don't necessarily have to go all the way. It can be a gradual process and I can challenge myself in other aspects of my life before I challenge myself to go, you know, flying off a swing in my bedroom with my boyfriend or with yes. my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I could just challenge myself to maybe talk to a stranger or look at myself naked more. Um, I, I think that, you know, with the amount of information that we're all just consuming all day, every day and what's going on with the current state of the world, sometimes it could be a little bit difficult to, realize that like we don't have to be and do everything at once exactly and then you could try little stuff little by little i love the stat that love honey gave and that this time about half of people have tried something new sexually in 2020 just as a result of like fuck let me find happiness somewhere because this world is a shit show um and also yeah. i'm home all the times and my body is a wonderland so let me find some joy or experience something new with through that and so i think that's actually an encouraging stat that when all else fails and everything else seems uncertain. We always have control over our bodies and we can find new ways to bring pleasure and excitement to our bodies. And so I'm also part of that pack, you know, who have tried something new this year and who have been able to explore and experiment this year, just as a result of needing to lean on myself more for joy, but also to your point, sort of knowing what my limits are so that uh, that joy never felt forced. Yeah. So we've talked a lot about, um, you know, how being comfortable with yourself kind of holistically is very important for sexual happiness. But we both know that historically women especially tend to have a hard time feeling comfortable with their bodies and not just in a sexual way, but just in the way that they look in clothes, in the way that they take up space. So I'd love to talk to you a little bit about that and your best advice for women who are really just starting their journey of becoming comfortable with their bodies, period. Yeah, I think my favorite advice I would give to somebody who said, I just don't feel good about me right now, what should I do, is to meet yourself where you are. I think the advice that we often give to people is to try to aim for a mindset that doesn't actually accurately fit what their current attitudes are. So confidence to me is not a choice. Uh, confidence is the result of feeling successful at something over a period of time. It's seeing yourself succeed and feel good and win. And then being like, I'm great at that. Like you get confident at boiling rice when you've done that five times, you did it for Thanksgiving dinner. Everyone's like, this rice is amazing. And you're like, yes, I'm I so did that rice. At it. 
That's all I want. I'm so glad I'm right. <laughs> but I think a lot of people think that confidence is something that you have to force on yourself, that you have to just look in the mirror and accept and embrace whatever's there, regardless of how you're feeling. And while, of course, we should aim for that, and of course, we have to acknowledge the multitude of barriers that are put into place to prevent, as you said, women in specificity from feeling good about themselves, because when women don't feel good about themselves, corporate America wins, right? That's when we buy more. And so there's a grand yeah. system at play that is designed to keep you feeling like less than. But even though you are aware of that, it doesn't change the fact that you might feel that way. And so when I say meet yourself where you are, I mean, acknowledge that. Really embrace whatever you feel your flaws are right now and look for tools that allow you to feel comfortable in spite of them. So for example, if I meet somebody who says like, I do not have sex with the lights on because I just do not want to picture what my partner is seeing at the time, I am like, great. Have you tried a colored light bulb? You know, you can go to Amazon and get ones that actually you can control by your phone. So you can set the mood to where you feel most comfortable. Have you tried a full body fish, uh, you know, fish, um, fishnet suit that keeps everything in place and has the holes exactly where you need them. And it's fishnet. So you can rip new holes where you want them. Um, it doesn't mean that eventually you can't work towards a space where you feel comfortable being completely naked with the lights on, but starting and meeting yourself where you are is acknowledging how you feel today and then looking for tools that support that feeling to give you that sexual happiness in the moment and authentic happiness, not the kind that you have to remind yourself, like I'm happy and I'm comfortable. Uh, Cause that doesn't sound that happy yeah. and that comfortable. Screaming in the mirror. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's, you know, there's such a focus and like an obsession with wellness in our culture today. And obviously, you look back on the past couple of years and wellness is just so trendy. But with that, I think we all kind of collectively developed this false expectation that once you become well and everything that embodies, you're just well for the rest yes. of your life, whether that means <laughs> being fit or being happy or, you know, having like an immaculate diet or, you know, waking up every morning and like saluting the sun and drinking tea instead of coffee. I mean, the list goes on, but I just, that has bothered me since it became kind of like the center of the cultural conversation because it is a constant journey. And when I look back on my own journey with confidence, I mean, sometimes that varies day to day or week to week. And it has certainly varied year to year based on where I'm at in my life, how work is going, if I'm in a relationship, what's going on with the state of the world outside of my window. And I, I love everything you said because I have felt just like as a woman and as a consumer that there is so much pressure to just become confident and stay confident or that you're going to turn a certain age and just be confident for the rest of yes. your life. But I'm sure you get the it, question it, all the time. Like, Ali, how do you get so confident? How did you find your confidence? Oh my God. <laughs> I'm like crying myself to sleep every day. <laughs> <laughs> Screaming at myself in the mirror. I am happy, but it really is like boiling the rice. It's like getting comfortable with the idea that I don't have to be totally confident, but also leaning into it. There is just so much power in embracing the times that we don't feel confident and embracing being imperfect. And I mean, if I had one mission in life, it's like, I just kind of want to hammer home that like, none of this is stuff that happens overnight. And it, it makes me sad that media and you know, our culture has made us believe that because our phones make everything happen like this, that it's going to change our kind of mental state to function like that as well. Absolutely. And uh, as somebody who's pregnant right now, I can so attest to that, how confidence Jeff definitely is not something that you get to keep for long, um, especially as my body is changing so rapidly and my symptoms are changing so rapidly. And so one day I'll feel like I figured it out. And then two days later, I feel like I'm in a completely different house um, with a bunch of roommates I've never even met before. So yeah. I think that's really reinforced for me just how many people you know live their lives. There's a multitude of reasons why confidence for you may not be a final destination. And I think even the people that we believe it's their final destination still have those daily struggles. And so the fight, I think, is what is sexy, the perseverance and the acknowledgement. I say all the time to people, if I meet somebody who says to me, like, I can't stand my FUPA or I can't stand the way that X, Y, and Z, I'd rather meet that person than the person who's like, everything's fine. Everything's great. Oh. No, I never feel sad. I never feel unsexy. I just embrace my body as it is. And it's like, which of course, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm, I might be a hating ass bitch. I might just be like, you must be lying. You Maybe. see me throwing up into my hands. I'm like, You're I being authentic. Be <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> but you know, I like to meet the people who can be honest because at least then you can identify a starting point. And when you can identify a starting point, you can start to look for resources, tools, mentors, and then start to work backwards. What are some of the influences you have in your life that are perpetuating an unrealistic expectation for you? You know, how can you reconfigure even your Instagram feed to reflect more of the use out there and use in a starring role? So I feel like when you can identify what it is that is preventing you from feeling like, yes, bitch, um, that's when the results can actually start to come into formation. So I'd rather meet somebody who's honest about what's bothering them than somebody who pretends that everything is great because they bought that one kit last year and they went to that one retreat and now everything clicked into place. Right. Or like, you know, their, their life is perfect and their boyfriend is perfect and their Instagram feed is perfect. And, you know, the filter is the same on every picture. I have a lot of tolerance for a lot of things in this world that I probably should not have tolerance for. But one thing I have no tolerance for is people who front. I think maybe part of that is like a New York thing. And part of that is just like the way that I choose to live my life. And granted, not everyone needs to live their life the way I've chosen to. I don't think it's for everyone. But um, I, I definitely just think that like, anytime I see somebody who's kind of putting on this mask, I'm like, oh, you're not only hurting yourself, but you're hurting the people around you. You're hurting the people who are looking to you to be a source of strength. And especially for women, I think all of us kind of subconsciously look to each other as to set an example or to see, okay, maybe she knows better than I do. What is she doing that I can emulate? Obviously in an ideal world, we'd get all of that from ourselves. But the truth is we are constantly looking for, you know, external sources to give us that sense of validation. So I'm glad that we're on the same page that people who front, that's, that's very last year. We don't have tolerance for that anymore. <laughs> that's the old wellness. No longer. <laughs> That's all of wellness. This is the new wellness, having absolutely nothing together. Um, <laughs> but you know, a lot of the, a lot of the, you know, wellness experts, especially the ones that we see on social media, when it comes to like tips for infusing your life with confidence and happiness, so much of it is like waking up early, writing in a manifestation journal, like savoring a cup of tea. But one of the things that I love so much about you and the work that you do is that you have a much more no-nonsense approach. And, and like you said, you do meet people where they are. So what are some easily accessible um, and easily doable confidence tips that have worked for you and have worked for the people that you've worked with? Yeah, something that I do every quarter and I encourage people that I, I work with or even just my audience general to do every quarter is to create a list. And it's a list of three separate categories. So the top of the list is things that you love about yourself. And I want you to get as specific as possible. I love my rings. I love my, left my nipple. relationship. I love my left nipple. I love my relationship with my mailman. I love my relationship with my mom. I love my plant that's closest to my biggest window. Whatever it is, like a really comprehensive list of everything that you love. And then in the middle, you're going to put the things that bother you. The things that you think about either daily or weekly that steal your joy or just make you feel less than. Um, and then again, be as detailed as possible. I hate how dry my heels are. I hate the fact that I still need my calculator to do basic math. I hate the fact that my relationship- I'm afraid of the dark. I'm afraid of the dark, right? Whatever it is, me and my dog don't walk as much as we should. Whatever it possibly is that you feel is bothering you about yourself, uh, write that down. And then the bottom section is for things that you just accept, things that you're neutral about. And this is, at the end of the day, sometimes our flaws aren't actually flaws. They're double-edged swords that can serve us in one way. And so while we may not, in, you know, kind of, we might hate the fact that we're a little bit of a know-it-all and we always feel the need to, you know, correct somebody or tell somebody something, we also acknowledge that's why we're successful in our career. We also acknowledge that our romantic romantic partner loves that part of us and thinks it's really quirky and fun. Um, also, there's things about ourselves we simply can't change. And so if you're six foot five and you wish that you were, you know, a little shorter, probably can't change that. So you would have to move that into that neutral category. And then what you do when you have that list is you look on that middle list and you say, how can I move this up or down? So there are parts of ourselves that bother us that we are just, we're honestly bullying ourselves. There's no solution. There's no need for a solution, but we are bullying ourselves based on a trait that actually is one serving us or two, just a natural part of who we are that we have to come to embrace somehow, some way. And then secondly, there are some things that we could improve that you want to move up. And then what you're going to do is after you put those arrows up or down, put one action step, just one. And I don't mean an action step like, um, oh, I hate my body. I want to look like X 
um, fitness model on Instagram. That's not one step. That's 5,000 steps, right? I want you to think of what is the very next thing that you could do to bring yourself to a place of self-acceptance. And so I, I mentioned the dry heels thing because last quarter that was on my list. I was like, oh, because I have, you know, I'm a, a woman of color. So all of my sheets are, are satin and I got dry ass heels. So whenever I move when in bed, it makes that like <laughs> Velcro sound. I'm like, that drives me nuts. Like, and then I'm like, bitch, fix that. So I put it on my list. I'm like, you could definitely fix that. And I bought myself like a pedicure kit. And once a week, I make an aim to do that. And even though it seems like something very simple, it actually does prevent me each day from having that like, bitch, your fucking heels moment. So um, I think that that's really massively helped me. And even just by putting those really tiny things, the really big goals that I've had for myself, the really big gripes I've had with myself that felt like mountains, I've noticed over time I'm starting to overcome. Um, so I'm really a big fan. Again, meet yourself where you are. And if you want to travel, think about the next step, not the final destination. I love everything you said. I'm trying not to clap into the microphone because that'll hurt both of our ears. But like, I'm just, that is so good. And I love your focus on specificity because also I, I cannot help but think about the correlation between the amount of time that we all, but especially like millennials and Gen Z spend on social media, looking for likes from two dimensional people that they can't see and being obsessed with how many strangers follow them and, and how that impacts the way that they see themselves and their self esteem and their confidence. And I think that so much focus is placed on how, how do we appear to others? How do we create a brand? How do we create an image and aesthetic that a lot of people don't even take the time to, to pull back and think like, okay, let me zero in on these really tiny detail oriented, like specific parts of myself because we're not trained to think like that anymore. We're trained to think like, how do we appear to people as like a big cohesive brand, which don't even get me started on that, but it is such a prevalent part of our culture now. And I love this idea of, you know, everyone likes to talk about taking time for yourself, but taking time for yourself to really sit and think about these like hyper specific niche things about yourself, that's, that's much more valuable than like, you know, sitting and, and, and writing in a journal about how you want to find a partner who is like the perfect astrological sign for you. Because you can't even do that unless you are aware of the fact that, for example, your heels will crack or like you're yes. afraid of the dark and you need someone to hold your hand when you go to the bathroom and then fill up the night. So I, I love that methodology and it, I love that it's also not intimidating. It's not scary. It's something that really anybody can do. It doesn't require a ton of like, you know, equipment or specialty. That's really awesome. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, uh, oftentimes we think about the result is when we're going to feel better. So if our goal is to get a degree and so we've been putting it off for so long because we're like, I don't have four years, I don't have the time. And so you end up prolonging it because you think that you're not going to get the gratification you're looking for until that degree is complete. But little do you know, the day that you sign up for school, the day that you apply for someone, you're going to start to feel like you've graduated. Um, you're going to start to feel the impact and the effects of that positive change in your life. And so I've noticed that for myself as well, too. I oftentimes put off long term goals because I think to myself, well, I don't have the space to even get started. And um, I need that. If I want to get that feeling, I want it today, not 12 years from now. And so let me wait until I've got that 12 year span to devote. And I've just been like, man, every time that I've put off something that I knew I had to do for me because I thought that I wouldn't have the space or time for it, whenever I finally did get started, my initial thought is always, you really could have easily done this five years ago. You really could have made the time <laughs> yeah. for this five years ago. Um, yeah. And it felt, it feels amazing to be doing it now and I'm really happy, but the lesson I'm constantly reaffirming to myself is start today. Yeah. Yeah. I, there, I'm just sitting here, you know, nodding my head thinking of so many examples, especially like my parents following me around being like, you could have done this before. You could have done this before. Yes. They were right. They were right the entire time. And I just, I, I, I keep thinking about how important the little steps are and the little things and just taking one step in the right direction and how it 
it shouldn't be difficult to do that, but it is because we do live in this world that is making us feel like everything needs to be done right now. And if you were just more productive or more efficient or had the right apps or had the right job or the right people around you, that all of a sudden things would just, would just happen. And that's so, sex is all about being human, right? Sexuality is all about being in touch with your humanity. And yet we live in a world that is encouraging us to be robots. And yes. that's, there's just such a divide there. And so, you know, I think it, again, like I said, it can't be overstated that like doing these little things is so important for having a more uh, sexually fulfilling life. And that's even when Love Honey had the challenge of try something different. And I was like, oh, like, what is the thing that I, I want to try? And, um, you know, how do I reach my goal of becoming completely, you know, my, my goal at the end of life, like I said, I don't have a goal right now to be like the freak who's done every possible thing in the arsenal, the person who always wins, never have I ever or loses, but I want by the time that I'm 80 to lead losing, you know, so I want to be picking up little <laughs> stuff along the way. I want by the time I'm like 90, my grandkids tell me some stuff. And I was like, I did that back in 2020 or 25, you know? Um, so the thing that I was thinking about, it was like, oh, I really kind of want to start incorporating some more non-traditional toys into the bedroom. So I literally, I don't have this here for this talk. I didn't prepare. I'm not that much of a loser, but it just happens to be in my <laughs> office. I'm just so I got this pack, this like Wicked Weekend pack thing. And essentially I was like, oh, I'm not even gonna use a lot of these. Like the nipple clamps probably aren't my jam or my partner's jam or like, there's a lot of these, like they, there's like a vibrating, um, like male masturbator toy. And first of all, we bought this and we just like kind of put it all out there like a doctor's table. And then I was like, I am the freakiest, most sexually liberated motherfucker on the planet. Um, so it was like just doing something small, like purchasing something um, that's under a hundred dollars that you can get for yourself that honestly gives you that result or that feeling in the moment and gives you that boost of confidence, not just to like keep going, but to keep trying new things. And so keep going and keep trying new things. I think that that's probably your, your clearest cut path towards confidence, sexual happiness, and self-actualization. I was just going to say, I'm sitting here thinking about you being 90 in a wheelchair and all your grandkids are around you and you're like, you guys think I'm in this wheelchair because I'm old. I'm actually in this wheelchair because I blew my back out being experimental when I was young. I had a walk. You know? <laughs> oh, oh my gosh, you're so the whoppiest of whops right now. Holy, <laughs> that is crazy. Uh, lean in, lean in. We love it. We embrace yeah, it. Yeah, I got it's a sloppy important. bop. <laughs> That's what's going on down here <laughs> in these streets. Own, own your so-called imperfections yeah. <laughs> with all your perfections. Lean all the way in. Um, so let's focus a little bit on like COVID and lockdown specifically and how that has obviously not only changed the entire world in a myriad of ways, but, you know, changed the, the ways that people are looking at uh, sex. And something that I find really interesting is not just people having more time inside to like explore themselves. And I want to hear your thoughts about that. But I do feel like sex has been reframed from this thing that used to be like something that we should be having or that we should be finding time to have or even a luxury, you know, like when you think about sex, you're like, oh, okay, I'm going to buy a hotel room or I'm going to make a fancy dinner and I'm going to like cut out this time to have it. It was almost like a luxury item the same way you go to a department store and purchase a bag if you were like feeling yourself. Now, sex has kind of been reframed as something that you do as part of a self-care process especially like masturbation. And I love that. I love that, you know, in the most dire of circumstances, we have been forced to become more in touch with our bodies than we ever have been just as a means of like survival. So I would love to hear from your professional opinion, how you have seen uh, people's sexual attitudes shift in the time of lockdown and, and what you think that means for like our future as a whole. I think my favorite thing has been the prioritization. Um, I think you probably felt this exact same thing too. There's a certain gratification that educators in our space get from people finally realizing how essential intimacy is for people finally acknowledging that when all is said and done and all the things in the world that we thought were super important, like our jobs and like going out every Friday night and having the yep. newest outfit. Um, all of that doesn't actually really matter when push comes to shove. What really matters um, when the most important things to us are in flux 
is that we are taking care of ourselves and that we are taking care of those that we love the most and that our intimate needs are are being um, supported, uplifted, and they're being indulged in and whatever that means to you. So I think that I've seen a reprioritization towards relationships, towards sex, towards sex uh, with yourself. And that's been gratifying, obviously not on the backdrop of what a crazy year this has been, but in many ways it does take extreme events for people to realize what really does matter in life. And I am happy that a lot of people are now starting to ask a lot more questions about how do I expand my um, sexual happiness? How do I make better connections with my partner? How do I reconnect with some of the most important people in my lives? And I don't know if that would have happened if it wasn't for the very stressful and difficult year that we've had. And speaking of that stress and difficulty, one of the things I do want to really acknowledge is that nobody's been through a pandemic before. Uh, nobody's probably had a year like this. It, in nobody alive has experienced yeah. what we're experiencing right now. Yeah. So no one gets to say how you're supposed to do it. We don't have any yeah. data that says like, oh, well, in your grandparents' age, they had sex eight times a week and they went on walks and they cleansed their chakras and that's how they best optimized this year or got through this time. We're all learning as we go. And even though we're experiencing something very similar collectively, the way that's manifesting in our individual lives can be completely different. Uh, I say all that to say that if you're not interested in sex right now, if you're not interested in masturbation at all, if you feel more disconnected than ever from people, and that has been the coping strategy that's been best for you, that's also okay. Uh, stress doesn't manifest in people's bodies the exact same way, and solutions to stress are not one size fits all. So I've definitely seen a range from people, those who have found like the stat from Love Honey said, you know, who have used this time to explore more when it comes to their sexual selves and use this time to get more in tune with their sexual happiness. And the flip side of people who have never felt drier and less whoppier uh, in their entire lives. And I think both of those are very fair and it feels good to you and you feel like you're getting through it. That's really what the goal is. I think of this year is. Yeah, and I definitely have experienced both sides of that spectrum. I've had moments where I feel drier than the sleeve of cookies that I just ate, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, I don't, I don't want to do anything other than sit here in my sweatpants that have not been washed in two weeks and binge watch horrible reality television that's literally so bad I can't even name it and continue to eat these cookies. And then, you know, I've had certain months where I'm really feeling myself and I've been like, okay, I'm ready to responsibly go back out into the world or at least, you know, order some awesome stuff off Love Honey and get to kind of know myself again after, you know, not looking at my lower body for a long period of time. <laughs> and <laughs> I think that, you know, there's, there's merit in both. And I'm, I'm so glad that you said that, you know, despite these conversations that you and I are having, that we're going to be having today at Camp Love Honey and, you know, that are being had all over social media, this does not need to be a time where like you're masturbating five times a day every day just because there's time to or because people are telling you that you should like you can go in the complete opposite direction. And it does not mean that anything is wrong with you. Um, but on that same coin, I am thrilled that the taboo of masturbation has kind of started to diminish during this time. I never understood why the the one thing that is so instrumental in teaching us what we like and teaching us how to be embodied in a physical sense was like you know presented to us in a way that made us feel like we should be ashamed of it so i'd love to hear your thoughts on that and if you've also noticed that the taboo surrounding it has kind of started to go away a little bit yeah. Um, Tanga does a uh, masturbation study every single year. They've done it for the past five years. And they, because it's their five-year anniversary this year, they were showing compare and contrast between the 2015 results, and the 2020 results. And exactly to your point, Ali, people's attitudes around uh, sexuality, especially people who identify as women, has dramatically changed. I'm talking about, in some cases, 20% improvements in the way Whoa. people are looking at masturbation. And so we're seeing rapid amounts of change. I, again, like I said, I've been in this space for a while. And when I first came into it, the things that I was talking about that were like edgy and revolutionary and the questions that I were getting are so different than today. We have come a long way in a short amount of time and we should absolutely celebrate that. 
I think that masturbation is now looked at as a form of self-care. And as long as it doesn't, again, impinge on your health or happiness, the health or happiness of those who are closest to you, it can be something very remarkable. I understand why, you know, traditionally masturbation was shamed. And I say this often to people, uh, you know, who have a like, well, you know, it says that we're not supposed to masturbate in this book, or it says that we shouldn't, or it says that this, and you're like, you got to look at the times back then, right? When they didn't have the access to birth control, they didn't have the access to healthcare that we have today. They didn't have the knowledge uh, of oppression and repression was like your greatest go-to. Like, don't even know how fun this is. Don't even experience how awesome this can be because yeah. you're going to want more of it. And it's a slippery slope. And if you do want more, I can't guarantee yeah. health is on the other side of that. But shit, like it's so fascinating. We're coming out with so many incredible technologies. Um, somebody was saying to me the other day, like, I just don't know. I don't think birth control works with my body. And I was like, I think it's identical to saying I don't think food works with my body. What food are you talking about? Like, what birth control are you talking about? Like, there is such an incredible range that people have and the choice and the options. And so I feel like that all is coming together to create an environment where people feel safe to play. People feel like it's healthy to play and there's more knowledge than ever, more common knowledge around the health benefits of orgasm, around the health benefits that it can have on your stress and your mental and physical health. Uh, an interesting thing that I learned recently is that when you have orgasms in your sleep or wet dreams, in many ways, that's your body being like, you ain't doing it, so I might as well, because it recognizes how important mm. orgasm is to its optimal functioning. And so your body might be using that, those sleep ways, as a way of boosting the systems that they know that orgasm provides. So I think that there's just a, a change in environment and also a change in options that allows us to be more sexually open and comfortable than ever before. And I hope that this trend continues to go up because I see a lot less stressed out people at the grocery store. I think there's definitely a positive correlation between that and masturbation. No question in my mind. No, no question. question. Everybody at, at Sprouts Anything? and Trader Joe's is so friendly and I'm not curious why. Yep. 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 You know, I feel like there needs to be more like public ad campaigns in New York and like really populated areas that are encouraging people to masturbate. It's like, we know your stress levels are out of control. There's an easy way to deal with this and it's free. Um, so what about people who want to take the leap from, you know, becoming really comfortable with themselves through masturbating or even just through spending more time alone doing self-care activities? But how do you translate that into finding the confidence to ask another person to help pleasure you? Because um, there's definitely a big difference between, you know, turning on the right setting on your sex toy and asking another person to touch you in a certain way or kiss you in a certain way or lick you in a certain way. And I can imagine that for many, many, many people, that's extremely daunting. So what advice can you give? You got to give your tips as well, too, uh, because okay, it fine. is. I mean... Communication is not about what you say. It's about what you want to convey. And so communication has to be niche. It's a, it's a delivery system, right? So how I tell you to get a glass of water will be different from how I tell somebody else based on how I know that they are best going to receive the message. So I think yeah. that uh, across the board, some easy ones are the yum versus yuck. And so, you know, there's, there's yuck, like, hey, you do this really weird sucking thing. It's not how I get off. Can you please stop? Or there's yum where it's like, when you flick my clit over and over with your tongue, your tongue is strong, it's consistent. Like it feels incredible and it's a mounting amount of pleasure for me. I can hardly control myself when you do that. Even if they did it once, one or never even at all. It's just a power of suggestion. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just saying what you like in the bedroom, it can be a lot more impactful than outlining what you don't like. Uh, yeah. Also too, it's acknowledging that it's, it's not easy for people to know and understand. So creating different languages that you can utilize. Like I think sound, right? I use sound a lot in the bedroom to uh, guide my partner. And so I will, sometimes I even have to communicate to them. If I get really quiet sometimes, it's because I'm very much enjoying it. If my breath yeah. is really heavy and I'm quiet, it means that like, I like what you're doing, but creating a dialogue that allows somebody to learn and it to feel positive to learn. I think talking about sex should always mirror great sex. And so when you think about what makes sex great, it's when it's open, it's vulnerable, it's wet, it's fun, it's explorative, it's inviting, um, and you feel good in the moment. So as long as your dialogue mirrors those adjectives, I think that you're probably doing something the right way. Yeah. 
you know, it took a really long time for me to find the confidence outside of sex that I was having within, you know, long-term relationships to ask for what I wanted. And overall, you know, I identify as a, as a pretty confident person, but you know, there's something about being in that vulnerable space and you don't want to hurt the person's feelings and you don't want them to think that you're dumb for asking for these things. But there's a quote that I actually saw on a park bench at a park near my apartment <laughs> and on, on the black, on the bench, it simply says, you are responsible for your own orgasm. And that really resonated with me. And I was like, you know what? I am. And, yes. you know, his, historically, a lot of men go into sex being very unashamed about doing what they need to do to get off. And even if it requires kind of going someplace else mentally or, you know, em embodying a, a character that's not really me in the bedroom, if that is going to help me ask for what I want and become responsible for my own orgasm, I think not relying on somebody else to get you to where you want to go is very important, self-sufficiency. And the more that you can do that, I find it makes it easier to open up. I feel like that's the perfect ending point because that is something that I've just been like really harping on a lot is when people are like, yeah, the partner, my sex with my partner is not great or like the sex with this person was awful. It's like you realize that you're 50% of that equation. Like yep. half of that is because of you because your ass was there. What did you do? Yeah. Uh, if you realize the person that you're with is not packing or bringing it the way that you want it to, what did you bring and what did you pack and how were you able to adjust in the moment? And so I think that, that there's like this real blame culture around bad sex and there has to be an ownership to it because your ass was there too. Yep. It's just like a friendship or a relationship or being a member of a family. Like it takes two to tango or, you know, sometimes three, four, seven, whatever you're into, you know, 80 year old tells me knows exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> seven. Yes. You cannot get out of the wheelchair. <laughs> <laughs> you need all the grandkids to lift you out of the wheelchair. But um, yeah, I, I definitely think that, you know, pulling your own weight is important. And, and, you know, relying on yourself is important, but being fearless of asking for what you want and when you need help and when you want assistance is important. And, uh, you know, this all contributes to, to the holistic definition of what sexual happiness means. And I think we did a, a pretty damn good job of dissecting that over the past 45 minutes. Hell yeah. Thank you so much for joining us today. This was so fun. Thank you so much to you, Ali, and to the entire Love Honey community. Uh, try something new, have fun. And I would love to hear what people's definition of sexual happiness means to them. I think that that's like my favorite question right now. And before we go, uh, your wish is my command, Shan, because we actually do have some answers from the community. Love Honey asked their followers on Instagram to define what sexual happiness means for them. And these were some of my favorite answers. Being with a partner from whom I hide nothing, enjoying the moment mm. and not worrying about my lumps and bumps, not worrying about the lumps and bumps, it takes a long time to get there, very important, we love that. Um, being spontaneous, as we've discussed, semi-regular sex and amazing cuddles, the balance between yes. the physical and the emotional, right, we love wanting each other and not feeling like the only sexual one in the relationship. That was one that really resonated with me, right? Feeling like it goes both ways. Someone says, it means knowing that full-blown penetrative sex is not the only way to have sex. Another moment of genius. Finally getting over trauma and being able to comfortably say yes to sex, genuinely wanting mm. it, genuinely doing it when you feel so inclined, being respected as a person by my sexual partner or partners, being comfortable with my vulva, being happy and loving myself, which in turn reflects in my relationship. Those were some that I thought were really special. Poetry, publish it. Do it. I will buy it. Louder That's my for the people in book. the back. Louder yes. for the people in the back. Yes. Louder for the people shit. in the back.